Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and we welcome you all to the monthly clinical meeting for the month of March, conducted by the Sri Lanka Medical Association, and this time it's in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Nutrition Physicians. Today's topic is on know the myth and evidence of weight loss. So to start today's proceedings, I would first like to invite our panel of speakers um, who would be speaking to you today on this topic. Dr. Manoji Kamake, Consultant Nutrition Physician, Nutrition Division from the Carson Street Hospital for Women. Dr. Nalinda Herat, Consultant Nutrition Physician from the National Hospital Colombo. And Professor Ranil Jayavardana, Professor in Nutrition from the Department of Physiology, University of Colombo. And Dr. Lahiru Kodidulapu, Secretary of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, to please come on stage. To make a small welcome note to you all, I would like to invite Dr. Lahiru Kodidwaku, Secretary of Sri Lanka Medical Association, to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, important uh, monthly uh, clinical meeting. As you all know, uh, this year, Sri Lanka Medical Association's uh, thematic area is ensuring health equity amidst challenging times. Now, this specific uh, monthly clinical meeting uh, in collaboration with the uh, College of uh, Nutrition Physicians is also in line with our uh, yearly thematic area. Uh, nutrition and LB has been one of the most important subject areas that we have been uh, engaging over the past years, as well as under the thematic area of this year, we have been sort of engaging with the relevant stakeholders uh, for the betterment of nutrition and well-being of our population. So on behalf of uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, I would like to thank the College of Nutrition Physicians for collaborating with us for this monthly clinical meeting. And I'll wish all the uh, resource persons and also the audience a fruitful uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, Dr. Anand Vijay Vikrama, President Sri Lanka Medical Association. And we would like for you to speak a few words, uh, sir, as an opening remark for the session today. Good afternoon. Uh, I was not planning to speak because I know you didn't come to listen to me. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I'm, uh, I would like to thank the, the, the resource personnel and the Nutrition Society for, for joining with the Sri Lanka Medical Association for this, uh, uh, to discuss on this important topic. As we all know, uh, Sri Lanka is uh, having problems with nutrition at this moment, uh, over nutrition as well as undernutrition. So it is very important to discuss on this uh, regularly and it's very important to educate especially the medical personnel. So in that sense, uh, I, I think this is very important and I would uh, like to thank the, the resource personnel for taking their time uh, coming for this uh, very important program. So without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to go ahead with the program. So once again, uh, I thank them and I wish you all uh, we'll have a, a, a successful session. Okay. Thank 
Thank you, sir. So we move on to the first session of the day. This is on obesity, the burden and impact. This will be delivered by Dr. Manoj Gamage, consultant nutrition physician from the nutrition division of the Castle Street Hospital for India. Good afternoon to all of you. And I would like to first of all thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Sri Lanka College of Nutrition Physicians for giving me this wonderful opportunity. So I'll be uh, talking as the first speaker today on obesity, burden, and impact. And my colleagues will lead you through the next other topics of obesity. So, so obesity is a pandemic according to the uh, World Obesity Observatory. So why it's in areas of India and Asia, it's in Europe, it's also in China, Japan, and that part of the world. And not only that, it's also among pediatrics. So among our children. So obesity is a pandemic. So what is obesity? It is the excessive accumulation of body fat with negative health consequences. So if you look at this picture, you will see the abdomen coming forward in most of the people we see today. And also, so what is inside it? The subcutaneous fat as well as the visceral fat. And so what we are most concerned when we talk about obesity is about the visceral fat, which is actually not a dormant tissue. It is a very active tissue. So I'll talk to you about it in my presentation. So I'll talk to you about the prevalence of obesity in the world, prevalence of obesity in our country, and uh, the pathogenicity of obesity, as well as the impact to you, as well as for the self, as well as the country. So this, uh, this uh, picture again is from the world uh, Obesity Observatory, which is, the, which is the largest research body for obesity in the world. So you can see the darkly painted areas, which is uh, like uh, the dark blue, are the areas which have the highest obesity level. So it's more than 30%. So you can see some part of America, the northern, uh, the northern and southern American continents, as well as uh, Australia. And our country, Sri Lanka, is still somewhere in the light green zone. So this is the men's distribution. And uh, we kind of, but it, it doesn't mean that we need to be comforted. Uh, we, let's look at the country's scenario in a more wide angle. So if you take obesity among uh, Sri Lankans, this is from 2022, uh, the nutrition National Nutrition and Micronutrient Survey. So you see that females are leading as usual. So we, the females have a higher amount of obesity and overweight, but whereas all the girls are having higher rate of obesity and overweight when compared to the boys. They are still in the, um, the smaller digits, but you will see that we are in a rising trend. So this trajectory from 2000 to 2020, uh, which uh, I took from the side with available data, so it shows a continuous rise in trend. So we are reaching the top and we are trying to uh, go ahead of the limits that is bearable to the country. So is obesity actually a disease of the affluent or whether you're educated, so if it is your rich, so is it among them only? So this chart shows that uh, from 2006 as well as 2006, 7 and 2016, where you see all the trajectories of the society, whether you are educated or whether you are not educated, obesity and overweight, the percentages are more or less equal. So it is not to say that it is defined to a certain category of the society. It is affecting the people who are already learned, also people are who are less learned, I would say. So why does obesity occur in that case? 
So the body is meant to be in an equilibrium. It's like a scale where you have the energy in and your energy out. So if you take that young man who is a lean man, so if you take, at least if this man takes some amount of energy and he also spends the same amount of energy, he will stay in that same size. So lean man person. Whereas if he takes more energy, too much than what he spends, so which is really quite logical, he will put on, so he will store the energy excess, excess into the body. So that will produce an obese person. So then again, so that person will tend to be obese. Then again, sometimes in your clinical practice, you will find people who are obese who come to you and say, Doctor, actually I eat very little, but I don't lose weight. So that is either he's lying to you, that's the amount of the food he's taking, or else maybe he is in an equilibrium in his own body fat. That means he's eating little as well as spending little, and the store is just the same. So he stays fat. So when talking about obesity, food intake is a very important factor. So what controls the food intake? It is multi uh, faceted. So we all know the homeostatic uh, mechanism from the hypothalamus, which is the one that uh, we, when we feel hungry, we eat. So, and when we are already, when we, are, uh, we have hunger goals, we stop eating. So this is the homeostasis or hypothalamus reflex pathway. So when a person is uh, having lack of nutrients, there will be a sensation of hunger and then you eat and when the stomach gets filled, it will stretch and that stretch responses and the uh, satiety responses will stop you from eating. So this is one known mechanism. So do we only eat when we are hungry? Of course not. Now the new year season is also coming. So we know that during our uh, celebrations as anybody in the world, during celebration times, you have social, cultural gatherings where you tend to eat even without you wanting to eat. So if you go to a New Year festival and your house and if you don't eat some at least something from there, it is regarded as uh, not very hospitable. So because of that, so this kind of stimuluses are there for the human intake as well. So cognition, so cognition part are the ones that control that part in, uh, in food intake. And also, uh, there are advertising. So even if you don't want one kind of food, but if it's always advertised, tell you that this is good to you, the good for health, and so all that, then you tend to take that kind of food. And also, the last, most uh, frequently seen one is we eat what we love to eat. So it is the reward center, the limbic and the paralimbic cortexes, areas of our brain. So we tend to have this hedonic kind of eating to reward ourselves. So you see there is multifaceted involvement in food eating. So it determines by the self, the family, the environment, your economy, as well as your education and everything. So when you check all these air types of all these controls, the cognitive and reward uh, systems are not very really understood, like they have no, not good understanding of what actually happens. But of course, in the homeostasis or the hypothalamus axis, it's quite clear. So the awkward nucleus of the hypothalamus uh, is the one that controls this hunger and appetite centers. So <laughs> Uh, the orange pathway is controlled by the neuropeptide by okay. transmitters from the hereditary neuropeptides. So, the is the one that connects with it from the gut level. So, when you're hungry, ghrelin is secreted and stimulates this arcuate nucleus and the orogenic uh, pathway. And when the food comes into the body, when it digests and go down the GI tract, then the other hormones secretes from the GI tract, the CCK, GLP-1, PPY, so all of them are anorexogenic. So they will signal the anorexogenic pathway, which is done by melanocortical uh, type of uh, POMC type of neurons. So also the adipose tissues of the body, so when the adipose tissues are accumulated, that will also secrete leptin, which is also telling the, it is also a satiety kind of hormone. So this is the primary homeostatic mechanism. 
So you will see that ghrelin is the only one that is actually a hunger hormone. So with all the others are actually satiety hormones. So with this uh, mechanism in our body, why do we actually get obese? So where we should be stopping eating. So what happens in obesity is that when people start eating and eating, so when the nutrients are always flowing in their body, so the brain also gets confused and there's obesity associated metabolic derangement. So when there's uh, this, our body system is prepared in a way that you need food, you eat it, and then you digest and you finish and you stop eating. But when you have food all the time and you take it all the time, then the, the, the availability in the circulation leads to various problems. And also there's low-grade inflammation developing within the adipose tissues, which gives rise to the inhibition of the normal control. So empty will be high, but it is mutagenic. So it will not stop the food eating. The satiety effects of fatty acids, glucose will go down. And also ghrelin will be persistently high in this obese individual. So they tend to eat a lot. So this is one mechanism where they explain why people keep on eating when they are not hungry. There's another explanation as well. So that is the hunter-gatherer area and our genetic modifications. So during the hunter-gatherer period, where all of us, the humans, have been. So food has not been in amber. So the genetic adaptations, which were able to store food and eat more and more when you have, actually survived. But of course, they had periods of no food for a long time. So they didn't become obese. But now, we have food all the time. So with the same genetic adaptations still not changed, we keep on eating. So because of this is another theory which says why people get obese. So in that background, I will just go for the impact of obesity. So impact of obesity is affecting the whole body. So we all know as medical professionals that we have a lot of non-communicable diseases coming up with obesity. So what is the pathogenesis? So there are again different theories. So excess of fat accumulation causes what is called an adipo, adiposepathy. So that means now when there's a lot of fat in the circulation and fat and high energy coming in, so then the adipocytes starts proliferation. So to store the, store the fat excess. And not only proliferating, it also expands. The adipocyte also keeps on getting expanded. So what happens, some areas of it might go into hypoxia when it becomes expanded. So there will be areas of hypoxia in the adipocytes. And so there will be depth of the cells in that area, and then there's apoptosis and inflammation generated. So that's why I said this excess fat will cause inflammation. So this mild low-grade inflammation will lead to insulin resistance in the person. So also it will affect on the cytokines, the good cytokines, which are oxidative, which are antioxidative kind type ones, like adiponectin, will actually go down, whereas still in alpha kind of bad ones will go up. So there will be difficult effects. So this is one pathogenesis of obesity. And also there is another way, another part of the same phenomenon. That is your gut microbiota. Now, they have always talked how important gut microbiota is to us in recent past. So, gut microbiota is highly influenced by what you eat. So, if you eat a Mediterranean balanced type of diet, you have a good microbiota and it is balanced and there will be no inflammation. But if you take high fat, high calorie, as well as the other factors, then there will be dysbiosis, which stimulates inflammation. So, in this both ways that this gut microbiota also provides this inflammatory media. So these two mechanisms both will set an inflammatory medium inside your body. So that is how the insulin resistance and all the non clinical diseases that we talk about comes upon with obesity. Hyperglycemia, hypertriglyceridemia, and hypertension, and so on. And also, this is just to explain how the cancer also occurs. So same theory. So there's inflammation, insulin resistance, and then when there's insulin resistance, insulin starts secreting, and then again, insulin-like growth factors will also increase, and susceptible target uh, tumor cells 
tend to aggravate with this response. And also, when you take cardiovascular wise, the right heart failure occurs when there is um, sleep apnea because of the obesity and then chronic hypoxia leading to right heart failure, as well as with the hypertension and subsequently going into left heart failure. So you see, for a person, you can talk the whole day about the effect of obesity. So it's not only about the who a person, but it's also about the country. So it has an impact on the obesity has an impact on each workforce of a country. So why? So this again, this chart from World Obesity Observatory shows the total cost of overweight and obesity in GDPs. So in 2019, it's about 1.2% from the GDP, and it's projected to rise to more than six by the time of 2060. So as a nation who is already struggling with the economy, so obesity is not a welcome visitor. So also the total uh, per capita of expenditure, you will see that in 2019, it was about 46, and it's projected to rise to about 25% when you reach about 2060. So the burden is coming up. And if you compare this, uh, this comparison graph I got from the same website, so this shows the cost of percentage GDP of various other countries as well. So India, Japan, uh, as well as Pakistan and United Kingdom. And you will see that our one is actually going way ahead. Our projector is quite high. So as a country, this is the time to be alert of this projector as a nation as well. So this is the time as health professionals, we should get together to come back this when it is in their primitive stages here. So to wind up in summary, the prevalence of obesity and overweight is rising in Sri Lanka. Obesity is multifactorial and it's complex metabolic and it has a cognitive pathway as well. Effects of obesity is not only personal, it also affects the entire country as well as multidisciplinary interventions. Looking at behavior and cognitive therapy is the most important thing to achieve sustained weight loss and good weight. So obesity affects every aspect of a person's life from health as well as to relationships. So thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Manoji, for that very interesting presentation. Uh, next, we are going to discuss on methods of weight reduction and overview. This will be delivered by Dr. Narinda Hera, consultant nutrition physician from the National Hospital of Colombo. While we set that up, uh, I would just like to remind our listeners online that you all can post any questions that you have for our speakers that will be taken up during the panel discussion in the chat box. Good afternoon. So uh, the previous speaker did a nice presentation on uh, burden and impact of obesity. So I'm going to talk about weight reduction methods. So uh, weight reduction methods can be categorized as lifestyle modification, pharmacotherapy, and uh, surgical therapy. 
So diet control and physical activity come under lifestyle modification. And I'm going to discuss about various dietary interventions in the world targeting weight reduction and the uh, pharmacotherapy, uh, physical activity and surgical therapy will be discussed by uh, Professor Anil Jayavardhana. So uh, this is fairly a new article published in Journal of Obesity and Metabolic Syndrome. And my presentation is mainly based on this article. Let's see how to categorize dietary interventions. Uh, dietary interventions can be categorized according to the amount of food intake, according to the type of food eaten, or according to the timing of meal. If we talk about the amount of food intake, mainly two types of diet are there. That is low calorie diet and very low calorie diet. If you consume 1000 to 1500 kilocal diet, creating daily calorie deficit of 500 to 700, that is called low calorie diet. This is recommended as an initial strategy. If you consume 600 to 900 kilocal per day, that is called very low calorie diet. This diet is recommended only for a short period and is used in severe obesity, sarcopenic obesity, obesity with type 2 diabetes, hypertriglyceridemia, and hypertension. Meal replacement can be used for controlling calories with less effort on calorie calculation and meal planning, it may be either total or partial meal replacement. If you categorize the diet according to the type of food consumed, there are many diets in the world. Low fat diet, low carbohydrate diet, high protein diet, ketogenic diet, Mediterranean diet, and DASH diet are important diets out of them. If the energy contribution from fat is less than 15 to 20 percent of the total energy and the contribution from saturated fat is less than 7 to 10 percent, that is called a low fat diet. And if the energy contribution from carbohydrate is less than 45 percent, of total energy. That is called a low carbohydrate diet. This is useful to control type 2 diabetes and it's a good strategy for initial weight loss. If the energy consumption from carbohydrate is less than 10% of total energy or less than 50 grams of carbohydrates per day and a relative increase in fat and protein such a diet is called ketogenic diet. This diet has some therapeutic effects on type 2 diabetes, ECOS, cardiovascular and neurological diseases. This diet is important to reduce the appetite, but the long-term safety is not known. Uh, ketogenic diet is contraindicated in pregnant women, those with type 1 diabetes, kidney failure, or cardiac arrhythmia, and in all the patients with frailty. If the energy contribution from protein is more than 30%, that is called high protein diet. This diet will improve your satiety and good for maintenance of the weight. However, High protein diets from animal sources should be handled with caution for people with risk of chronic kidney disease. What is Mediterranean diet? This is usual diet of the people who live in Mediterranean countries. It consists of high amount fruits, vegetables, poultry, fish, dairy products, and monounsaturated fats with little to no consumption of red meat. This diet is helpful in improving cardiometabolic parameters and cognitive function. 
how to control the weight by meal timing. Intermittent fasting is a very famous method of weight reduction under this category. It can be divided mainly into two ways. That is alternate day fasting and daily time restricted feeding. If you consume less than 1000 kilocal per day in two days per week, that is called alternate day fasting. And uh, if you fast 16 to 18 hours daily, uh, that is called daily time restricted feeding. So, what are the benefits of intermittent fasting? It improves insulin resistance and it has impacts on appetite, improves beta cell function, reduces fatty liver and it reduces weight, reduces leptin and increases adiponectin. So, these are the advantages or benefits. And here you can see the disadvantages of intermittent fasting. It is somewhat difficult to sustain and maintain. Only limited evidence there to support it. And intermittent fasting increases insulin resistance. In my previous slide, I mentioned that it will improve, I mean, uh, it reduces insulin resistance or imp improve insulin resistance. But that is for a short period. That is because of uh, sudden weight loss, right? But uh, in long term, uh, you can see um, body switches, ketones, and fat from glucose. So due to that, uh, that will increase insulin resistance in long term. So um, it may cause dehydration, hypotension, and other safety issues. High blood sugar fluctuation will uh, increase microvascular and macrovascular complication. And at the same time, uh, lean muscle mass loss and worsening of motor neuron disease also reported. Not only that, bad mood with uh, fatigue and stress due to ketones, hypoglycemia, diabetic ketoacidosis, diabetic, uh, sorry, hypophagia, severe hormonal imbalance, especially sex hormone and menstrual disturbances and poor sex drive, difficulty of uh, sustaining daily activities are reported uh, disadvantages. This diet is not suitable for children, pregnant women, um, people with metabolic disorders and with high physical performance. So let's talk about few other special diets. So low GI diet, Nordic diet, vegetarian diet, DASH diet, portfolio diet, Atkins diet, and Ornish diet. So low GI diet. In this diet, high GI foods are exchanged for low GI alternatives. This strategy benefits in managing type 2 diabetes and decreasing body weight. However, it does not provide a complete nutritional picture and does not include recommendations for daily intake of fat, protein, or fiber. Another special diet is Nordic diet. It is based on unprocessed whole grains, high fiber vegetables, fish, low fat, dairy food, lean meat, or all types, and uh, beans and lentils, fruit, dense breads, tofu, and skinless poultry. This diet recommends more calories from plant and it significantly reduces body weight. However, these types of food may not be easily accessible or affordable to uh, most of the people. So another famous diet is vegetarian diet. It can lower the risk of ischemic heart disease, type 2 diabetes and cancer. It reduces blood pressure, improves lipid profiles, inflammatory biomarkers, glycemic control and other cardiometabolic risk factors. However, we have practically experienced uh, difficulty in weight reduction and preventing uh, sarcopenia in vegetarians. What is DASH diet? 
that is dietary approaches to stop hypertension. This diet was originally developed to lower blood pressure without medication, but it is now considered one of the healthiest eating patterns. This diet includes many vegetables, fruits, grains, with an emphasis on whole grains. And uh, sodium recommendation is 2,300 milligrams per day. Now, the benefit of this diet is it reduces risk of cancer, cardiovascular risk, and both all-cause and cause-specific mortality. So let's talk about the portfolio diet. Portfolio diet, it's a vegan plan that emphasizes a portfolio of foods or food components that lower cholesterol. When these foods are eaten together as a part of a healthy diet, they presumably lower LDL better than any one of the portfolio foods could alone. To include portfolio of cholesterol lowering food, this diet contains 2 grams of plant sterols, 50 grams of nuts, 10 to 25 grams of soluble fiber, and 50 grams of soy protein. Uh, however, meat, poultry, seafood, dairy, eggs are not allowed, as I mentioned at the beginning. So uh, there is evidence for weight loss, but it's very small. The Atkins diet is a popular low-carbohydrate eating plan developed in 1960s by a cardiologist called Robert C. Atkins. It restricts carbohydrate while focusing on protein and fats. The Atkins diet has several phases for weight loss and maintenance. Hyperuricemia, hypercalciuria, hypocalcemia and osteoporosis are the disadvantages of this diet. So what is the difference between Atkins diet and keto diet? In Atkins, carbohydrate in, uh, intake is gradually increased, while in keto, it remains low. The Ornish diet is a vegetarian diet that is low in fat, refined sugar, and animal protein. It doesn't label food as good or bad, and there are no restrictions on calories Unless you are trying to lose weight, this diet may help weight loss and protect against chronic disease. So, finally, what I have to emphasize is there is no single best strategy for weight management. Hence, strategies for weight loss and its maintenance should be individualized and healthcare providers must choose the best strategy based on patient preferences. The most successful diet is one you can sustain for the long term. Healthy plate model is a practical and sustainable approach for weight reduction. The next speaker, Professor Rani Jayavardhana, might provide more details on this model. So good eating habits support health benefits later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nalinda Heras for that very interesting and informative presentation. Next speaker for today is Professor Ranil Jayavardhana, Professor in Nutrition from the Department of Physiology, University of Colombo. And his topic will be Challenges in Weight Management. We request those joining online to post your questions on the chat. 
and those of you in the audience to have to be ready with your questions, and we are happy to take uh, questions during the panel discussion at the end. What do you say? Thank you. And And first of all, I must thank for the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association and Sri Lanka College of Nutrient Physicians for the inviting me for this uh, talk. And uh, you can see the title, title of like a challenge is the management of obesity. So when it comes to obesity management, there are two phases. So which I'm going to discuss for the second phase. And most of my colleagues who are working in the field of nutrition and medical even endocrinology. Sometimes they talk about the success story of the weight loss. So actually, that's not a success. All this success is the weight management is a weight maintenance. So don't forget about that. There are many methods to lose weight, like uh, Dr. Nalinda explained clearly. And there are a few more methods, also like a very uh, fat diet, also some are like a soup diets, which we don't recommend sometimes. Drinking just water, there are huge fasting phases. We don't encourage. The challenge is not a weight loss, it's a maintenance. I think Dr. Manoj gave a nice background about the impact of the obesity for the world as a Sri Lanka. These are our local studies. It's clearly epidemic and it's increasing. So there are no argument. Probably we all have to face for the obesity epidemic and it's among us and among our family members and probably definitely among our society also. And it reached to the real high level. So we had to have a lot of strategies to control that. Although there are several mechanisms for the uh, weight gain, but if you go for the simple mechanism for the, this obesity epidemic, there are there are few cases could be monogenic or there are due to hormone imbalance. But I'm talking about obes obesity epidemic is due to be simple energy balance. Like again, Manoji explained. So if someone getting more energy than expenditure, yes, store as a fact. So this is very simple. But if you go to the real life, it's not very simple. Because this energy balance as of the many individual, social, and probably physical activity, probably some biological parameters. That's why it's very difficult to handle. That's why even most developed countries like the US and Australia and Europe, the obesity become an epidemic, they don't have solutions also. At the moment, we don't have any preventive or creative measure for the obesity epidemic. We were successful in the COVID, but not obesity. So because it's linked with all these parts in our food productions and some individual psychology or our food preferences and biology as an activity and our culture aspects also. So keep in this mind because the side, the different diet is important for the weight loss. When it comes to weight management, probably my focus mainly not on the weight loss phase. And probably you all can do this well. You can help someone to cut down calories using different methods. It could be vegetarian diet, it could be uh, ketogenic diet, it be intermittent fasting, or we generate current plate bottle concept. Again, it's a low in calorie method, but this is the challenge. And for that, for maintainers, you need to have a lot of skills, and which included basically proper lifestyle, and, and which include again diet and exercise. You might think probably our patients are not very committed, that's why they weight free again. No international evidence shows. Almost everyone weight regain within five years. That's extremely common. We have few colleagues who lost weight to regain weight. We have few friends, you know, like that. You know, that's very common. It's not their mistake. That's normal. If you go to biology behind that, also like hunt together in time. Just when you kill animal, you eat it, you get all energy, you store it. Next day there's no animal, so you could survive. How? Because you use we use that energy what we stored. How? We get all three meals. We, we, we eat every every time, but we don't get, get a time to burn it or waste it. So that's why we, we become obese. But when you, when they go for the weight loss diet also, we have a same memory. That means if you don't eat food, your metabolism should be reduced. And when you eat it, yes, it should be stopped. The same thing happens with those patients who lost weight with the time. When they are going for the normal dietary habits, they regain. So these are extremely common. So how we can handle that? So that's the challenge actually. Weight loss is not a challenge. I can call any fool can lose weight, but to maintain, you have to be very, very smart because you need to have a lot of skill for that, not the weight loss. 
and these are with new drugs and the GLP analogs. And but you can see the way the process is made. Even when it's your drug, it's drug, it's not possible. The same thing applies with all these diets, whether yeah. it's a ketogenic yeah. diet, intermittent fasting diet. Oh. Oh. And so what are the strategies? And this published in NEGM, so popular, yeah, of course, it's the best journal in the world. And this group of people were who lost weight in the past, and then they, they divide for the maintainer space. So they all lost weight. And they come to the maintenance space. You can see everyone, almost everyone, they weight regain. And not only control those when the low protein, high GI food, low whatever method, they regain, except one group you can see here, they could maintain the weight loss also, even after several weeks. So what they had actually, high protein, low GI food. So probably that's the one of the take home message. If someone is lost weight, after that, for the maintenance, encourage them to having relatively more protein, which is uncommon in Sri Lanka. We, we consume more carbs. We are not con consuming a lot of protein. So probably we can add a little more protein and low GI food. That's been probably adding vegetables, fruits, and grains so on. So that could be the one strategy that's published in the very good, I mean, high impact journal paper. And what are the other strategies? So again, this is a maintenance trial. Because weight loss studies are very common, but maintenance trials are extremely rare because you don't get a positive result. They're always is negative. So it's very hard to get a positive result of maintenance. But this study also shows a few things. You can see these are like a few significance. Those who are eating more fruits and vegetables have a positive weight maintenance. And those who are the dairy also have a positive maintenance. And it makes sense of those fruits and vegetables not very really high in calorie, probably they have a high filling power as well as they provide nutrients also. And they, they also have high protein calcium, probably think this is the metabolism also. So, and these are, I mean, something we can enjoy also. So we all enjoy fruits and vegetables daily. So, so weight maintenance ways also, we, we should encourage them to have probably two cup of milk or uh, two glasses of milk. It could be like a always low fat or non fat. And probably two, two fruits, and again, should be low in calories. It's very easy to identify low calorie fruits. It shouldn't be sweet fruit. And vegetarian, of course, all type of vegetables are fine as long as they are not starch vegetable. So that's something we can encourage. So with maintenance, it's a simple that doesn't still play, play the place. And those are having dairies and fruits and vegetables. Other things are not very important. And this is a behavior change. Weight loss is always behavior change. So having more support during maintenance phase. That's mean if they visit you more, uh, they have a better in, uh, outcome. That's mean even once they lost weight, ask them to come regularly, probably three monthly, or probably even monthly basis in the beginning, and that help them to maintain the weight. Probably they will monitor their weight loss, and probably they will adhere for your plan, which included healthy dietary habits, like taking more fruits, vegetables, and dairy, and low GI food, and high protein diet. So after one stay of sweat, don't leave them and you will continue to support. Relapse from the obesity is even higher than breast cancer, so many cancers. So it's, it's very difficult to maintain. So the support is needed. When it comes to activities, actually, now what we give for the general public, for everyone, we encourage 150 minutes uh, exercise per the week. That's like 30 minutes, probably five days per week which is not enough for the, those who lost weight. That's enough for the overall health and probably to reduce heart, cardiovascular diseases, probably to improve, improve their uh, body weight. But those who lost weight, that's not enough. Once they lost weight, their metabolism is anyway low and probably they have already lost their lean mass. So, so preserve that muscle mass and improve the metabolism and cut down that hunger, probably they need a higher amount of exercise. And this shows uh, this is a very small sample because very few people do vigorous exercise. So this is the only way to maintain the weight by exercise. It should be really vigorous, which call like 4,000, 5,000 uh, calories uh, 
per week as energy expenditures, that's probably like more than one hour running. So it should be very, very vigorous exercise for the weight maintainers. So general public ex uh, physical activity advice is not helpful for the those who lost weight. So they, they have to probably extra, probably one hour, one and a half hour, probably five days per week or more than that, and which include consistent exercise also to preserve muscle mass and cardio exercise, probably increase their metabolic rate and, you know, for the cardiovascular benefit. So exercise is not an average level, it should be very high level. The finally, and we are nutrition, so probably we don't prescribe very much, but there are a few drugs in Sri Lanka. We have only one drug, uh, Lysian at the moment, which is Olistat, which is a lipase inhibitor. However, it's not very effective for our people because we consume more carbs. But those who are eating high fat diet probably can be effective. And unfortunately, it's not very cheap also, not too expensive, but not cheap also. And there are a few new drugs. Those are not free available in the market. There are GLP analogs and there are oral one and injective versions, but they are extremely expensive and they are effective. Now, new trend is that they're effective, but those are not freely available and not for, for the every patient can afford. Yesterday, we did a more, more like a same lecture for the our medical student with, with the Professor Katlander. Actually, this is one of his slides. He mentioned it takes more than 100,000 per the month for the obese patients to lose these drugs. So it's not affordable for the many patients. Sometimes like 300,000, some drugs are 300,000 for the one month. And once they finish it, they regain. So that's not practical for the developing country like us. Those are really massive, probably this diet and ex exercise or even drug therapy is not very effective. So this is the treatment of option is a surgery. Like any other thing, when you have joint pain, probably it's enough in the beginning, but later on, probably you have to go for the surgery. Like he also, bariatric surgery is a place for the very obese patient. And now guidelines actually shifted for the lower BMI cutoff also. And someone with the metabolic problems, that means probably they can't, uh, they, they, can, they can't control their diabetes with the, some medications or they have a sleep apnea. Even BMI 27, they can go for the bariatric surgery. And for the most of obese patients at the BMI 32.5, 20, 20, uh, they can go for the bariatric surgery. Initially, it was a 35, and I cut down to 32.5 or so. So this is option for the morbid obese patient. They are very successful. Most of patients lose 25 to, to 35 percent body weight. And it's very hard to regain also. So they maintain that for the very long period. So in finally, in this percentage, I, I would summarize, like Manoj mentioned, obesity is a public health problem. It's a pandemic, the world. And weight maintenance is a major challenge. It's not a weight loss. It's a maintenance major challenge. So that should be very close as possible to their usual dietary habits. So don't do very fancy diet for your patients. They might lose weight, but they can't maintain. So take their dietary habits, modify accordingly, having a basic principle, which is a low, it should be low in calorie. What are the main type of strategy? Adding a little more protein for the, every meal, probably giving low GI options, and fruits, vegetable daily probably helpful for that. And frequent visit, even after weight loss, they should visit you. And very high level physical activity is not a regular level, should be very high level. Some patients, they might need medical and surgical treatment also when this lifestyle is not very effective. So thank you for your attention. So what I encourage the old obese experts to be like a role model also, otherwise your patient will not listen to you. So, we can take some questions. Thank you very much, sir. Um, now we are ready to take uh, any questions that you may have for our panel. Please post them in the chat. Or you in invite the audience to please uh, request for the microphone. And to moderate this uh, session, uh, mainly uh, the panel discussion, which we have planned for now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. B.J. C. Herrera, past president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, to kindly join the panel and to share the mission.
very much. Uh, I'm afraid all the obscure is uh, uh, rather tied up. So you have a reservoir to take in charge of uh, the proceedings uh, for the uh, next bit of time. So are there any questions from the audience or from the electronic board? We are getting some questions online. Can you please elaborate on the exercise regime for weight loss? Can you please elaborate on the exercise regime for weight loss? And uh, I would like to invite anybody in the panel to take this question. Right. And uh, generally, uh, the patient's very sick and patient's temporarily acting, I would encourage it and to be good. But there are most of patients, those are middle aged, probably they have a growing pain, probably they have a very little bit of weakness. I don't encourage except for the weight loss person. I would encourage for the weight maintenance. So, in the beginning, I would start with a low carry diet, probably the first few weeks, and they lose probably 5 or 7, 6 percent body weight with extra, uh, without exercise, only by diet. Then, probably I had genuine exercise, which included probably sometimes people that they also enter the joint problems and probably slow walking. Probably at the end of the Weight loss plan, which we are going to take a 10 percent weight loss, then it will be like a serious exercise. So, weight loss, very little place for the exercise for the weight weight gainers. That's the main that they have to uh, uh, weight maintain. Exercise for main that's the main thing. So, in the beginning, I don't know, but it's also very physical people. They they can do exercise for that also. Thank you, sir. Uh, a short question: Can metformin be used for weight loss? Can metformin be used for weight loss? Not for the not for weight loss actually. But one of the side effects of that is it causes a little bit of nausea feeling. So it might be the same type. And so you can be the patient will be there with an obese as you might be for the short period. If you have been efficient effects, of course metformin will be low on drug for the cabinet control or cardiac cell disease also. So it might be. But it's not lighter for the weight loss. What is the most evidence-based diet for weight loss and improved health? Answer is there in my lecture and the interview especially mentioned that there is no single diet for single based diet for weight reduction. That should be uh, highly individualized based on the patient's preferences and his lifestyle, everything should be considered and should be tailored. <laughs> and following up on that, can we adapt the Mediterranean diet to Sri Lanka? Yes, of course, uh, because we have enough of uh, seafood and we have a variety of uh, vegetables and fruits. Um, most of the thing we can add to our Sri Lankan diet. <laughs> I would like to take a pause there and if anybody in the audience has any questions, we do have some more online. But, uh, can we give? Uh, yeah. Can I ask a question from the you know, panel? Um, I don't think anybody really concentrated too much on the children, uh, which we see. I mean, I see that as a pediatrician. Um, uh, what are the prospects of uh, being able to get them to lose weight um, in children, I find it really a very difficult thing um, because uh, we find that uh, many of the children are reluctant to listen to all this kind of advice. And uh, what we have tried to do when we see um, children with uh, fairly significant uh, obesity, we should try and get them to maintain that weight. So as they grow, that at least they will reach some degree of, um, of rational weights for them. I don't know. Uh, what do you add in? My dear. Thank you, sir. Uh, so actually, uh, weight, uh, weight among pediatrics is a very uh, biological problem as well. So, in reducing their weight, basically has to be a very sensitive one. So, if they are breathing with certain aspects, uh, then of course uh, they will be going in height. 
So therefore, we have practice maintain the weight so that we assume they will get dark enough when they go taller. Of course, if they are um, of course few water, then of course there is a phase of waste reduction. And also, even if they are breathing water, and you see the comorbidities in them that are coming up. Um, and they are not sure in a hurry or so on. So in that case, we might have to go for a weight reduction. But still, when you do that, it's not no side diets. You have to just concentrate on giving them a good amount of balanced food. So mostly they are obese because of their environment. There are a lot of triggers in children. So remove all those triggers. And most important thing I would talk about childhood obesity is the prevention. So we have a very good weight uh, monitoring system in our Sri Lanka. So we measure our children. So the moment you see them skipping the lines, we have to stop them there. So that is the time I think best is to prevent in children. Otherwise, it's very uh, a very sorrowful thing to tell children not to eat. I'll move on to another question online. Is vegetarian diets inferior to non-vegetarian diets in terms of nutritional value and health benefits in Sri Lankan setting? Basically, low in calories. So, in Sri Lanka, most of the vegetarian diets are actually they lack of vegetable also. They may be have a like a take a lot of breakfast calorie for the steam of our toast or something. It is vegetarian because they are no meat, but they are no vegetable also. And one of the key of the weights of uh, is and weight maintenance later also having a more, more fruits and vegetables, and especially vegetables in our main dishes. So, uh, if they can achieve that vegetable, the main dishes. So that will be fine. Okay. Another problem is the vegetarian diet in Sri Lanka is very low in low protein. High protein again, we mentioned it, not very really high. But there should be something of protein or weight loss. The maintenance should be a little high in protein. So it will be very challenging to get a protein in the vegetarian diet. But if they are very really smart, yes, that's possible. There are soya meat, there are probably uh, low fat form, there are some vegetables, relatively high in vegetables, like legumes compared to some other vegetables. So they have to find those high vegetable, high protein vegetable also. But it's a little difficult in Sri Lankan context and uh, compared to some other countries. Thank you, sir. How much of a calorie deficit should we maintain to loss to lose weight and preserve muscle mass? Like so 500 calories we really discuss, but it's very theoretical. You can argue on that. No, 75% of calories intake on our expense. So not a deficit actually. If someone needs like 2,000 calories, if someone is burning 2,000 calories, and uh, so if you do a less than that, only you will lose the deposit cap. Then that's uh, the very difficult for the also. So, so first we have to calculate the energy expense for one person. Then we have to do something less than that. Then only they will lose the slow cap. Not that cutting out the intake actually. If obesity is defined on fat excess, how accurate is it to assess by BMI? To measure the obesity. The ideal method to measure is uh, you know, someone dissect and take it. There is no other method. So, so what we have like estimate methods. So then we can use the Excel scan or BIO or there are other CT scan. There are many methods to measure the body composition. But we, we in mind, it's a surrogate for that also. That's why it's not very sensitive for South Asia. So we have to use a lower BMI cutoff to get like a fat, fat percentage. So in our studies, we have done some high quality studies using beautiful dimension taking. We, we identified your 23 should be like obesity cutoff, uh, OA cutoff, and 25 is obesity cutoff for South Asian diabetes, not the Caucasian cutoff. Most of this obviously world or those kind of websites they use actually BMI 30. That's why we probably like a green color, but we have high fat in the lower BMI. So so it should be lower BMI. So we are BMI is easy better. Otherwise, what you can do, you can add the waist circumference also because we don't just uh accurate obesity. So if you can find BMI as a waist circle, you can get a good idea of the patient metabolic status. Thank you, sir. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Please raise your hand and we will be happy to provide the microphone. 
Okay, so I'll move on to another online question. Is there a way to reduce visceral fat through diet or exercise? And actually, yes, no matter. So it's me. But the intention is only reduce and exercise probably reduce the visceral fat. But if they lose weight, they lose fat for the old abnormal days, and including visceral fat. So, but if someone maintain the weight and lose visceral fat, it's the only way that they lose the Do artificial sweeteners really reduce weight? Sweeteners are not meant to reduce weight. They are actually meant to be some pressure for the kind of lag diet that the person should take when you are in the process of losing weight. But actually, the thing is, when you uh, eat the same stimulus, that is, sweet stimulus to your tongue, in the long run, you are not going to set your appetite center in a low level. So, when you take the long run, if you are already taking a sweet, that means you will always go back when you see that sweetness. So, therefore, it is not recommended. So, this is the behavior actually. So, you change your behavior to be there rather than, you know, dumping it off. So, if there is no evidence to say that we can help you. Can I also uh, put the main with some question? Probably uh, for Professor Javadan, uh, that um, the, you mentioned that to maintain uh, the weight, that some of them may need to exercise uh, to the extent of. Uh, Losing up about say 4,000 to 4,500 calories. Now that is generally the amount that is the, that is that's right. That by uh, uh, elite athletes. So how 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 successful uh, would that be if you want to get uh, one of our uh, patients to to try and do that degree of exercise? Right, probably 4,500 calories per. But they that's mean probably like excess probably like thousand calories or one thousand five calories by exercise. So so probably it's like one and a half or two hours, but it's, it's very challenging for most of the people. So that's why there's a way in. Unless they have some physical weakness or their cardiovascular weakness, they can do. That's why we go for only modest weight loss, probably five to ten percent weight loss. Then it is really easy to maintain. And uh, but we provide some metabolic uh, improvement. May not be mechanical improvement, yeah, yeah. may not may not be good for their joint pains or sleep but there are only uh metabolic improvement. But if they are not very fit, it is very hard to maintain that weight loss. Thank you. Um, about uh, the periodic fasting, is there anything a blanket uh, sort of condition to say that over a certain age that people should not be um Using periodic fasting. There are no such a thing. So, I have to take some ethnic groups that are Muslim population. At the moment, they are fasting, depending on their age group. Of not with children, but probably, you know, uh, adults and children, people are doing. And uh, we used to be like the uh, used to fast when we are under any status, and, you know, even the agricultural status, we were fasting. Uh, but problem nowadays actually when when they fast probably they are, they are, they probably they have to increase they are up to at least that will be twenty per calorie. So but while they are fasting they lose their muscle mass and fat mass one day once they eat, probably they will not gain their muscle mass. They will have to gain many fat mass. So if they go to this uh, low low diet and weight loss and gain the period of fasting probably they will end up with a bad body composition compared to someone who have a uh, normal body function, so that's we don't encourage that. In our days, what we encourage, we may be fatten, and in between, that we have these snacks, probably some fruits, vegetable loading, or something, and uh, not a high calorie the snacks, and which we all can practice. Are there any questions from the audience? There's one more question online. Uh, most Sri Lankan peoples people use a method called one of method. In one of method, is there any clinical evidence based on that diet plan? So, 
So even the slave is like just keep it and we shall see in this world more than a thousand, a hundred years. So initially in 1920, it was good for the education. I think still do the complete education. So there's no transition. So what's happening in there? You, you are giving low carbohydrate diet and giving high fat and high protein, which creates high fat. So your body is cheap for the fetal density. So it has some positive benefits also, such as the appetite and probably. And in the beginning, there's a weight loss also because of the low carbohydrate, because there will uh, uh, their glycogen source is depleted. So with that, they have a water loss also. And later on, actually, even you might think this high protein, high fat diet, hey, see, if you take the same thing for a long period, it reduces your appetite. So you will not eat it also. So ultimately, they come to the low calorie phase. So because of that, they lose weight. But in Sri Lanka context, it's very hard to maintain that kind of balance for the lower weight. I mentioned all these challenges like a weight loss, for a weight maintainer. So those are following a keto diet. And they, they struggle to maintain having a normal lifestyle. They can't eat like probably many times, so they can't eat probably beef or cake, or they can't eat stream of us. So they struggle. And ultimately, you get a pressure for the glucose. So they lose a very important part of life, the pressure. So uh, that's why we don't encourage keto diet for the lower period. There are some countries possible, like if you are like, like acting also, some countries they always don't keep that, they only eat like protein, fat, no carbohydrate. So if we but have a kind of culture, we based on the agriculture made carbohydrate diet. So that's a problem also, but we can't give up that. So what could be like a practical solution? So basically, like uh, Dr. Nanda mentioned, eat this protein by cutting down carbohydrate to some extent and add more fruits and vegetables and eat it so okay, like that. So not like a zero carbohydrate. And same time, we have to ingest it also. So uh, that means they, they can have a daily and fruits and vegetables also. So we don't encourage this to ingest the data that no There will be some people it might be suitable, but as a general public, it's not suitable. But this is a bit of a cult now almost, uh, this particular diet that uh, was mentioned by in that question. So, um, uh, there, there are many, many people who are actually following. So, any comments on this? Yeah, it's a pattern in the world pattern, actually. In the, in the, that's one point in the US. Uh, early, uh, uh, 2001, 2002, 11% of people followed me by being that. This is also people that. And then, after a few years, they understood they can't have that kind of pattern for the long period. So, again, it's good. Yeah. Again, it would be decades, you know, that it, 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 it comes. Now, in, in Sri Lanka, it was new. The reason because because the phone that you did in the patient did not get a chance to approach the pro proper healthcare profession. So they they actually depend on the social media. So these are actually these that in the main like people that that very popular social media. So they follow that because we were not available and most of our doctors were not available to do like a proper. So they did have solutions to follow. But what we have seen now, now they lost weight in that phase. Now they are coming with a weight free gain. And uh, so there's no point of following that and that if they can't make it. So a uh, very few people are successful with a keto diet. So many people they have regained. They they think it's like a, they are mistake. No, it's not a mistake because they follow a very strict diet, which is not a bachelor for the lower thing. Same thing happens in the middle of the also very common nowadays. Because you get a pressure for the food and they skip their meals. So virtually when they start eating like normal person female meals. They regain what they lost. So again, this specific we don't encourage that. This uh, Atkins diet is sometimes used by sports persons where weight control is quite important and some of their competitions are weight limited. So uh, for a short term loss of weight for them to qualify to take part in athletics. I think you know it has been used. Any comments? This low fat diet can use this widely the way it's the sport, like a boxing and for wrestling and for the weightlifting, gymnastics. And it's because of their performance, actually. So some some sports demand performance. So sometimes when you go to low fat diet, probably they, they can't concentrate when you go to this, that is low concentration and probably they need low energy. But at the same time, if they have to fight stuff like lifting or something, they can lift some weight. And I think like a 50 kilos, but it, 
one still look to the locality. Still, they have like maintain the 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 memory and to live that way. So they might perform that job. And which more weight loss systems don't carry that even rehydration sometimes possible with the experienced athletes. But for the other sports like the athletic so probably think that what kind of we don't enter this kind of one more question. Do we have to keep on changing diet plans for weight management, for lost weight management? Do we have to keep on changing the diet plan to maintain the lost weight? Okay. So that's a very good question because, like, but initially it should be like that. You can go for a very low high diet also. But later on, it will be low high diet. Actually, at the end of the weight, not weight maintenance, that diet should be very close to their usual diet. But still, it has health care. But as health care is, the oldest we repeat, you know, having more vegetable fruits and, you know, having grains and high fiber grains and high protein. So we, we have to keep on changing. Otherwise, they get up with the diet plan when they pass the lower period. And ultimately, once they achieve the weight loss, it's an exercise to maintain and the behavior change. So they don't want to follow like, the speed that then once they lost it. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions from the audience? What kind of exercise regime is the ideal way to lose weight? Is it only cardio? In the beginning, we don't enter excess, but if someone really wants to have excess prescription, but we enter it to warm up. That's like early stage, they have to do like a warm up. Probably like a five to ten minutes warm up. Then probably they can do physical stretching. Then to to main muscles, they have no resistance exercise. Like leg muscle, back muscle, from chest muscle. Then they can do different cardio exercises and probably have the exercise. And finally they can pull up. So that could be like exercise for people, anyone who are in exercise. And but weight loss we don't encourage. Uh, weight loss the main data yes, we feel they have to go for the complete exercise program, which includes resistance and cardio as well as and oil size and probably because the exercise program. I think exercise description for maintenance of weight is a highly specialized thing. I think people to really um, go through uh, very intricate mechanisms of uh, uh, the use of various different types of muscles in the body to do that. So uh, it has to be done by a person who is very experienced and uh, uh, expert in the topic. If you're going to maintain a proper exercise prescription for maintenance of weight. Do we have any more questions from the audience or any at all? That's all that we have from the chat for the moment. Please raise your hand if you have a question. A lot of questions have really already been discussed. Uh, so I think it's about time for us to close. Uh, and on behalf of the Philanthropic Association, uh, let me thank the three uh, resource persons for a very erudite presentation. I'm quite sure that it would have been of much use to the people present in person as well as those who have joined us electronically. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's show our appreciation. By the usual, uh, we also have an open uh, of appreciation, and I would like to invite uh, Dr. B. J. C. Vera uh, to the center of the stage to present each of these two resource persons. Uh, first of all, Dr. Manoji Gamagi, consultant nutrition physician from the nutrition division of the Castle Street Hospital for Women. Dr. Nalin Dahira, consultant nutrition physician from the National Hospital, Sri Lanka. Last but not least, Professor Ranil Jawadana, professor in nutrition from the Department of Physiology, University of Colorado. Thank you. Thank you, dear chairperson and all our resource persons. 
and thank you all for joining us, both online and our audience here today. So we hope to meet you next month with our monthly clinical meeting in the month of April. We bid you all a pleasant evening today, and thank you once again. See you until next month.